Derek Chauvin trial day 15. The government called many new witnesses today. We were wrapped up some of the questioning that was taking place yesterday with the people are calling her the hostile firefighter. Yesterday, we sort of closed the show and closed the day in court with the judge Cahill scolding her for being overly argumentative with Eric Nelson, the defense lawyer for Derek. And Saw her today finish her line of questioning. Nothing else happened, right? Very easy. I think one or two questions out of her. And so she moved on. And then we started getting into new witnesses. Some were interesting. Some were, were you know, kind of not interesting. They, I, you know, I don't really know what they were there for other than the fact that the government just sort of wanted to really double down on their claim. So we're going to get into all of this. Let's first start by taking a look at the board. This is the trial board that we have. We saw a lot of testimony or a lot of questioning today from Mr. Frank. We also saw Mr. Schleicher down here. And then we saw uh, this new woman. I still don't know her name yet, but she is a new prosecutor. And yesterday she was out there uh, uh, interviewing the underage children or the, the minors at the time, and we didn't see much else from some of the other people. But uh, today we had three different prosecutors, of course, out there on the field. And we also saw Eric Nelson doing some cross-examination. So we're going to break this down. We're going to start off with the first witness who was the store clerk. And I think we have this guy. This is his image right here. And so he was literally working at the store. His name is Mr. Martin, one of the, fir uh, one of the first real full witnesses that we got today. And he's he was in the, the court when George Floyd went into the building. And so this was the scene. This was a screenshot from some of his testimony today. This is the store clerk uh, who, who's basically seated here for a large part of the, the testimony today. This is George Floyd, who's over here. And he's sort of in walking around this store for a good period of time, somewhere about, you can see here, 735. And he doesn't really leave until about 745. So he's in there for you know well over 10 minutes or right around that time. And you're going to notice as, as you're sort of watching the testimony today, he's kind of pacing back and forth. He goes off camera over here trying to buy something, so on and so forth. Not really relevant to a lot of the issues at trial, but they're framing this stuff out. They're laying foundation and they're getting a lot of witness testimony in in order to just frame out the whole situation. And so. You know, George Floyd is kind of walking back and forth. He says that there, you know, he he had no difficulty understanding him when he's on direct examination. So the government is asking him questions and he's communicating. No, he's about 10 minutes. Manager came out, had conversations. And then at some point, he sort of recognized that what George Floyd paid with for a pack of cigarettes was a counterfeit bill. This was where the whole 20, this is where the whole thing started, right here in this store, because George Floyd allegedly passed over a fake counterfeit $20 bill. And this led to sort of a series of interactions where the store clerk operator went outside, tried multiple times to have conversations with Floyd and the person he was with outside of the store in their vehicle. And we go through this. It was a long line of questioning this morning. And so we, he walks us through the whole thing. Yes. My, I talked to my manager. Manager said, go outside, tell him to come back in the store. Okay. I went outside. I told him to come back in the store. He didn't come back in. All right, go tell him again. And around and around we go. And then at, at, at some point, uh, things escalate, obviously. And so we're going to hear from Mr. Martin as he's describing this uh, counterfeit bill, which is really where it all started. We've all heard this for a long period of time. You know, the 20, the 20, how did this all start? What, what initiated this entire altercation? And it was this moment right here. So let's take a look at it. This is the store clerk. You can see him standing here and you're going to see uh, George Floyd's not in the frame anymore. The time you'll notice is at 744, 59 p.m. And then he's basically the prosecutor is asking him questions and you're going to see that he picks up a $20 bill and kind of waves it around. So here that is. Now, if I freeze it here, I'm sorry. I said so I you see his hand. Run, but um, we saw you holding something up. Can you describe, and again, for the record, this is 745.10, describe for the jurors what you were doing there. Oh, I was holding up the $20 bill that I just received. And is that something you always do or something about this? No, when I um, saw the bill, I noticed that it had a blue pigment to it, kind of how a $100 bill will have. And I found that odd, so I assumed that it was fake. Okay. But Mr. Floyd is still there, correct? Yes. Um, and you completed the transaction? Yes. All right. And then upon doing that, did he leave the store? Yes. All right. So now let's let that run, please. 
Okay, so they go back into this, and it's actually a, an interesting story. You know, this this young man was trying, was kind of wavering, waffling a little bit. Should I let this go? Should I tell my manager? Because apparently in the store they had a store policy that if you take somebody's uh, money and it's not legitimate money, then that comes out of your pay. That comes out of your pocket. You got to cover the cost of that. So, you know, he's sort of having this internal debate with himself. Should I tell him? Should I just cover it for him? And they're, they're sort of, you know, the prosecutor reiterates a couple times. So you could understand him, right? I mean, he, okay. So, and they're, they're sort of, you know, flushing through this issue and it's not really relevant to the case in my opinion, right? Ultimately what this boils down to is the cause of death. None of this really has much to do with the cause of death, but it is laying out the entire scene. And so you're going to notice as we go through this segment today that we, we've heard from a lot of lay people witnesses. We've heard from just regular civilians kind of walking around. We heard from the firefighter yesterday who was off duty. We heard from the mixed martial artist and other individuals who are just sort of recording bystander videos, and that's it. This is just walking us through the timeline, fleshing out what happened piece by piece. And by the end of this segment today, we're going to be hearing from a lieutenant from a police department who is now going to be transitioning, and we're going to he's just going to sort of guide us away from some of the bystander video and take us into the formal official videos from the on-body cameras for the different police officers. So uh, this is... That was the prosecutor asking questions about that. This is Eric Nelson now coming back out and doing a cross-examination of this same store witness, asking him more about slurred speech and about his perception about whether or not George Floyd was intoxicated. Because you'll notice if during the direct examination, and I didn't think this was very good for the prosecutors, quite frankly, but they show this for about 10 minutes. So they show this whole scene. And the whole video just played out in court. And what you'll notice, I saw this, the defense attorney asks about this, but the court clerk doesn't confirm it. But you'll notice that George Floyd is sort of walking around. He's kind of pacing up and down here, and he's doing this little this little dance. Eric Nelson calls it a dance, but it's kind of like a jimmy. You know, he's just kind of like, you know, amped up or 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 maybe he is dancing. I don't know what he's doing, but he's kind of bouncing around and looking like he's moving erratically. And I noticed that in the video. I don't know if the jurors noticed that, and I don't know if, uh, well, obviously Eric Nelson, the defense lawyer, noticed that he asked the court clerk about it, but didn't really kind of spend much time on that. And they, no, I didn't notice that. I didn't see that, and they just moved on. So you know, I'm not sure if the jury would have heard that or not. But that would lead to, to in my opinion, that would lead the jurors to sort of taking credibility into the statement that we're going to hear next from Mr. Martin, who is saying that he perceived. Floyd to be intoxicated back during the original investigation. So let's take a look at that clip here from Mr. Nelson. You, um, you had had a, a pleasant interaction with Mr. Floyd. Correct. You were asking him about sports and things of that nature, right? Correct. And you um, formed the opinion that Mr. Floyd was under the influence of something. Correct. And you base that on sort of, I think you said, a delay in his speech and response, right? Correct. So you were have, unlike a conversation that we may be having right now, uh, that's rapid and if you asked him a question, there would be much more of a slowed or delayed response. Correct. And I believe uh, in your interviews, you also indicated that he was having some trouble um, with certain words. Correct, and he was trying to form the words. Right. So he was delayed in his speech and uh, you believed him to be under the influence of something. Correct. All right. And um, you were present when your coworker called 911? Correct. And do you recall um, him telling 911 that he appeared to be under the influence? Correct. <clears throat> and you had also had... Uh, by the time 911 was called, you had had two other interactions with Mr. Floyd out of, outside of the car. Correct. All right. And so you made the decision after Mr. Floyd handed you this counterfeit $20 bill um, that you weren't going to call him out on it like you did with the earlier bill. Correct. And um, was that in part because you felt maybe he's under the influence? Partially. Partially, um, the other person that had come in, it kind of seemed like he was trying to scheme, like he knew it was a fake bill and he was trying to get over. I thought that George didn't really know that it was a fake bill, so I thought I'd be doing him a favor. Okay, trying to help him, trying to help him out. 
All right. So, you know, tough, man. Tough, tough position. Young man. I think he's 18, 17, 19. He's just just over the age. Obviously, he's over 18 now, but tough, you know, and there's some language that comes out during I, I believe it was his testimony. I could be mistaken about it. But, you know, had I not had I not made a big deal about this. Maybe he's still alive and nobody's sitting here today. So very emotional. I mean, the look on his face is he kind of just looks like he's in pain, you know, it's, and I, I feel for him, right? Somebody died. He's, he's got a very small part in any of it, but, you know, you just kind of ha- let that cascade of guilt just weigh on your shoulders. We're all, we all do this, right? We're all kind of guilty of this. What if I had done something differently? Would anything have changed? And so he's going to have to carry that around for some period of time. Now, he's also providing some good information about this case that he presumed that George Floyd was intoxicated. So did somebody else at the store. And so from a prosecution perspective, I'm thinking, why do you even bring this up? You know, they got to, they got to get some of the backstory in, and there are only certain number of witnesses who can do that. Obviously that is not a good fact for them. Right. And they had to know this was coming out. So they're going to make this, you can see how their strategies sort of evolving a little bit where this is not, you know, they, they have to sort of negate the, overdose allegation or minimize the role of drugs or in any intoxicants in this case as as much as they can. And that's where we're seeing a lot of the testimony come out about maybe Chauvin was actually digging his knee harder. You know, there's more malice here than we thought. And that's going to explain away some of it's going to minimize the drugs. They're going to maximize one aggressive component of the defendant and they're going to minimize some of the bad facts on their case. So this guy, you know, kind of came out and the jury saw what I, if they saw what I saw on that video, then he, George Floyd was just kind of bobbing around a little bit and acting erratically. And you, you know what that feels like, right? You know, when you're in a grocery store or a convenience store and somebody's just not behaving quite right. And he looked like that to me, the store clerk, of course, did not notice it or didn't comment to it, but maybe that's because he's used to that type of behavior. But, you know, many people, if somebody's dancing around in the middle of the, or just bobbing around, you know, just kind of moving around uh, abnormally, you wonder, is that person on drugs? Are they sick? Are they unwell? Do they need help? Are they having a seizure? Are they mentally ill? What's going on? And, you know, I, I noticed some of that. Be curious if anybody else did. Of course, Eric Nelson did as well. So then we get to our next witness. This guy was, uh, was very, very interesting today. And he's an older gentleman and I'm calling him the nosy witness, the nosy witness, because he admits it. We're going to hear from him in a minute, but he just was kind of driving down the road and he saw that there was a police car pulled over. Something was going on. So he just parked his car, got out and walked on over to the scene. And the prosecutor's like, well, why'd you do that? Why'd you get out and go poke your nose over there? And go, well, I'm nosy. I'm just a nosy guy. <laughs> so I wanted to see what was going on. And so he's very kind of charming in that regard. He's just very empathetic. I think you can, a likable guy. And you're going to see why that's pretty important here in a minute. So he comes out here. He's wearing his, you know, his, his nice glasses, really stand out. He's a memorable witness. And he seems like a very nice and charming guy. This was him. This comes over from the Exhibit 38, which was submitted by the prosecutors today. So he kind of explains that he parked his car. I'm not sure if it was this car or whatever, but he gets out and he's just walking on down the street now. And so uh, he will also be telling us uh, this is why he did that. And this is this is that clip on why I think this guy's charming. And so there's a little bit, you know, he kind of struggling with technology a little bit. But this is an important uh, an important component of criminal cases. You got to remember, it's not just about the facts. It's not just about what somebody says. Somebody can get up there and say, well, there was 11 nanograms per milliliter of fentanyl in there, and that's probably what killed George Floyd. Okay, that might be a fact. That might be some toxicologist's opinion. They might have the opposite opinion of that. Who knows? It's irrelevant. But what, what also matters is how the jurors weigh that person's credibility. Do they believe them? Do they think that they're being sincere? And a lot of that comes through emotion. That's just how we as human beings judge whether a person is being sincere or not, whether they're kind of vulnerable, whether they open that shell up a little bit and let you see inside. It creates that inner connection, that strong bond. And so he's kind of doing that right here. And just just by being kind of, you know, a, a charming old guy, just, I'm just just curious. So let's watch in and see how that went today. So you were talking about where you were. Um, Using this map that's up on the screen, could you just describe, you can actually use your, uh, there's a little pen there, stylus pen, you can use that to sort of show the jury on the screen where you were and where you were headed. I mean, see, that's my old. I didn't start to verify it because I can't hardly see what you're going to I was on the corner 38 in Chicago to make a left to go east towards 47 and high water. So I was right on the corner of 38th Chicago. So you were headed east on 38th Street, is that right? 
Yes, which would be right here. Okay, perfect. Um, is that right? Yes. All right. And when you were action with uh, somebody and some police officers, what did, what did you see at that point? Well, when I made the when I made the left, <clears throat> I seen a gray, a blue. There was a Mercedes Benz truck on the right side with a police officer standing at the door. So I automatically made a right turn and pulled over. And what made you decide to stop and pull over? Being nosy, you know, just being nosy. I'm in the neighborhood. I'm, I'm a nosy person. <laughs> Did you want to know what was going on? Yes, being nosy. <laughs> so when you first approached that area, you saw, you said an officer standing next to a blue Mercedes truck. With the door open. With the door open. Um, did you see what the officer was doing at that point? No, not at the time. Okay. All right. So, it, 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 very charming, right? I mean, I, I, how can you deny that? And you can almost hear the prosecutor cut off a little bit. You can hear the, the witnesses or other people in the courtroom kind of snicker a little bit. He says, yeah, I'm nosy. I'm a nosy person. I went, uh, yeah, I'm a nosy person. And everybody goes, okay, right. So that's pretty funny. It's charming. And it, it humanizes him a little bit. It, it sort of disarms people who are watching him. Whereas some of the other witnesses that we've seen thus far, they'll come out just with their heels dug in, just right. Every time somebody asks them a question, they're about to just explode, especially if it's the defense lawyer. So this, this guy comes out just very, you know, amicable, uh, what's the word affable doing, doing a, a very nice sort of gentle old guy who is just charming and there to help. And that's where this goes into. So now he tells us a little bit more about what he's doing. And this frame comes over there and they, what they did, the prosecution did a very nice job here. They are superimposing the officer's body camera foot frame. So there's another officer who's on the inside here. So they take this portion of the video and they super, they basically match it up so that they're in sync. So as this video progresses, this video progresses. Now I'm not going to play this because of course it's a gruesome scene. YouTube uh, flips out about some of that stuff, but you've seen the video. That's this guy that we're talking about. He comes up and he's having a conversation with George Floyd right there as all of this is, is going down. And this looks like it's Chauvin right there, sort of looking at each other. Right. And so, uh, you know, this is this is kind of a new angle. It's a new thing that we had not seen thus far. And he is now going to be telling us what what was going on. What was he saying there? What are they talking about? This is him explaining the scene from his perspective. Why was he walking there in the first place? And it's interesting. And I want you to think about this from both sides. Okay, The government is introducing this witness, in my opinion, because he's a very compelling witness. He's, he's going to get emotional, as we're going to see here in a minute. And he's a likable guy. He's charming as hell. And he is somebody who witnessed what he saw. Right, So he's going to come in and tell the story. But at the same time, he sort of he's sort of arguing on behalf of the cops. You're going to hear from this conversation that he's having with Floyd. He's basically saying, Hey man, just stand down. It, it's over, right? You've lost this thing. So just give up and, and comply. And you're going to hear him say that I was just trying to make it easier on him. Right. And, and you know, that type of language is dangerous if you're a prosecutor, because now it's sort of framing Floyd as being the unreasonable person, whether you agree with that or not, it's, it's sort of irrelevant, right? You can, if, if somebody's saying, Hey man, stop fighting, stop resisting, just let this thing go. And that person doesn't do that. Well, why not? Right. The argument in law is what would a standard reasonable person do? We have this guy who just walks down the street. Seems like a pretty reasonable guy to me. He's telling Floyd, Hey, relax, make it easy. Can't win this. Just let it go. Floyd doesn't do that. He continues to react. He continues to, to fight and the defense is going to have fun with that argument. So here is the nosy old man, the charming guy explaining what's going on. Um, now, just to sort of summarize what's happened thus far. Are you having a conversation with Mr. Floyd at that point? Yes, ma'am. And what's going on in that conversation? It's going to be a conversation that I'm watching, you know, Mr. Floyd send it. He clasped over to the back seat of the police car. And I'm trying to get him to understand that when you make a mistake, once they get you a cup, it's no certain thing as being class folk. You're going to go with them. And I was trying to get him to go. Okay. And you were saying, is it your voice saying um, things like you can't win? Yes, ma'am. And why were you saying that? 
Because I have had interaction with officer myself, and I understand once you get in the cup, you can't win. You're done. Okay. It's just the way I have looked at it. So were you trying to um, just help him to... Make the situation easy. Got it. Um, so you were trying to make the situation easier. Um, and he, there were some comments about, uh, you know, I'm claustrophobic, and then I, I believe there was a response. Were you having a conversation with Mr. Floyd at that, at that point in time? Yes, ma'am. And did you um, feel like he was hearing you and understanding what you were saying? Yes, ma'am. And um, like you said, you were just trying to make it easier and help. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So two ways to interpret this. Number one, he was trying to calm the situation down. He was acting as a reasonable person. He was trying to communicate to George Floyd. George Floyd, as he just said, heard him, was able to understand him, and still continued to act the way that he did. And I'm not saying that, that this was that this justifies anything that happened, but I'm just saying that you have a reasonable person on the sidewalk telling George Floyd to calm down. He doesn't. And in fact, he kind of gets you know, a little bit more agitated. We see them try to put him in the back of the car. He flips out the other end of the car and the rest of the, you know, the rest of that is history. So on the one hand, you have somebody saying, I was trying to calm the situation down. George Floyd was also not doing that against my own advice. And he heard me and he could understand me and he still was not compliant. So if the officers were trying to be compliant, they're trying to get him to be compliant. This guy comes in, tries to get him to be compliant. He's not what, are the, what does that leave the officers with? What choice do they have now, right? They have to escalate their use of force. That's how the defense, I think, is going to frame it. Now, you know, kind of converse to that, you could say that this guy is delineating a pattern of police brutality or misconduct or inappropriate behavior with African Americans, right? Because he said specifically, well, I've had interactions with the police. Sounds like he's been in handcuffs before based on his opinion on how it works. Once you're in handcuffs, the game's over, he said. So if you have, you know, that that inclination, okay, well, look, it's not because Floyd did anything wrong. It, it's not because this was an, an attempt to make it easier for the officers. This was just a response to this massive, uh, tyrannical, dictator-like police force that is out there ravaging the African American community. And so I just told him, "Hey, man, you know, you, it's it's a losing battle. Just kind of bend the knee to these oppressors, right? You can interpret it that way." And so you know, it's it's kind of a kind of a wash at this point during his testimony, whether this is helpful or harmful to the prosecution or to, or to Mr. Chauvin, really, because he's, he's also indicating that, that Floyd may have been unreasonable just based on the fact that he was also trying to get him to calm down. Again, you can have interpretations on that any which way, but this is where in this next clip where this is powerful stuff. So what happens next after this first question that we just covered, they play part of the video where George Floyd is sort of put on the ground and they watch this, they're, 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 they're just playing the video, the whole thing in court. And then at the end, it's, I don't even think they finished the video in the middle of the video, this nice, very, very, very charming, reasonable man breaks down in tears right in front of the jury panel. So let's take a look and see what this looks like. Mr. McMahon, do you need a minute? <laughs> I'm not sure if there's water as well. Oh, okay. If you need a break to get some water, let me know. We can take a break. <sighs> May I approach, Your Honor? You may. <laughs> okay. So Miss Faith just said we had a little hiccup on the stream, but apparently it's back. But uh, so as we could just see, you know, this this man was obviously crying in tears, obviously very upset, very traumatic thing that he witnessed. Now he's in court having to testify about it. Very high stress situation. So he breaks down on the stand. I let me now we're going to talk about an issue here. 
but I want to just be clear. I do not think that anything that we saw there was not genuine. I believe this guy, right? He's when I watched that today, I thought this guy's credible as hell. He feels that I'm not asking him whether he feels that or not, or whether that's justified or unjustified. I think it's justified. I, I believe him. I empathize with it because a man died. There's no question about that. The, the issue that we're seeing and the reason why I'm going to bring it up now, again, this doesn't even apply to his clip to him specifically, but it's about performative witnesses. It's about witnesses who know that this thing is nationally broadcast, that everybody's talking about it because it's public. We may or may not see some performative witnesses, people who are coming out there and turning it on a little bit for the camera. Right. And I didn't bring this up yesterday, but I should have because it was more appropriate when we were talking about the firefighter. Her name was Genevieve Hansen, and she was testifying yesterday, and she was getting very argumentative with Eric Nelson about this. And the judge scolded her before the, the, the day was closed, before court ended that day. The judge released the jury and brought her in and then scolded her. But before he did that, he said, you know, Miss Genevieve, we want to make sure we have a word with you. Jury had left the room. What was the first thing that she asked? And I didn't listen to, I didn't realize this again until I listened to it again. She said, are the cameras off? And the judge said, oh no, they're on. This is on the record. And then he scolds her on the record and that's all public. And so for, for that person, now you start thinking, okay, she was asking about the cameras. She wanted to make sure the cameras were off so that she, so that she did not get scolded in front of the country. Cameras were obviously not off because this is formal on the record. And so she got scolded anyways. She came back into court today, was on a, had a whole different attitude. So it, 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 that leads one to believe that that was a little bit more performative than maybe it would have been had this not been a publicly broadcast trial. So for her, I think maybe that criticism is, is a little bit more appropriate. And it's still understandable, right? I, I get it. I under, I'm not trying to, to poke fun at her. I know she's not a professional at any of this. She's doing what the, she thinks is right. She's doing what she thinks is best. And she, you know, this is one of the biggest moments of her life. So she's trying to do the right thing. She, she's doing what she knows best. The judge recognized that it was not appropriate and he nudged her back into line. But the point here is that the court needs to keep that order. It needs to keep that demeanor from, from sort of uh, in control. So it doesn't spiral out of control. So you don't get witnesses like that because sooner rather than later, what you'll see is the prosecution pointing fingers at the defense. Well, judge, you let their witness get away with this and you let our witness get away with that. And nobody's, it, it, it kind of turns into a free for all. This gentleman is a different situation, right? This is somebody who's breaking down, crying in the middle of testifying. What do you do about that? You can't call this guy back into court and scold him. That wouldn't be appropriate uh, regardless. But, you know, you could, you could imagine a situation where somebody is sort of feigning tears or making much ado about nothing. Not appropriate in this case. I'm not saying that's what happened here. But you just this is kind of an element of criminal law, an element of trials and, and litigation, even civil litigation, where you just got to be cognizant of what these witnesses are doing and how they're acting. And I know it feels a little bit inhuman, inhumane even, right? We're seeing a, a very tr touching moment with this man. And we're sort of, you know, as, as a lawyer, you got to be a little bit mechanical about this, kind of take a step back and say, all right, you know, nice performance or on to the next witness. And so, uh, again, I think this guy was totally genuine. I feel for him. But we're asking ourselves this question with all of the witnesses that come out. And now we have a pattern. We had somebody who was argumentative yesterday. We have somebody who's very emotional and sobbing today. We're seeing a lot of emotion in this part of the trial right now. Just keep that in mind. All right. So lastly, we, learn, we, we finish off with somebody who's not emotional at all. This is Lieutenant Jeff Rugel, 32 years in whatever law department he's a part of. He is here today as a foundational witness. So he actually works in law enforcement. He wasn't there on in May of last year. He's actually somebody who's going to come in and tell us about cameras and about how the data systems work in law enforcement. And what he's doing is he's laying the foundation so that they can get into evidence as exhibits the body camera videos from the officers who were there with George Floyd on that day. And so they can't just you, know, you can't just walk into court and say, uh, hey, judge, I got this video on a thumb drive. Can we can we just play this for the jury? 
No, oh, just cram it in there. All right. Yeah, there you go. Hey, look at that. Right. You got to lay foundation. Where did this come from? Who recorded this? How is this stored? What date was this on? Is it encrypted? Who has access to this? Did anybody manipulate the file? Is it the real file? You know, can we, can we run some analytics on it? Where did it come from? Is there a chain of custody? And on and on and on, right? A lot of issues that you can spot with digital media and the chain of custody and where it was all originated, whether you can even get it admitted as an exhibit in the first place. So this guy comes in and you're going to hear this line of questioning from the prosecutor as they're going through. It's going to sound like kind of very basic questions. You know, tell me about body cameras. Oh, they're about the size of a deck of cards. Okay. And they attach onto your thing like this. So he's got to, he's got to, we got to know that when they do introduce this body camera footage, that somebody can come in and talk about it, tell us where it came from. It's called laying foundation. And so that's what he does. Not that interesting, but it's pretty important from a procedural perspective because, you know, some people may be asking throughout the rest of this trial, well, why can't they talk about that? Or why can't they talk about this thing? Well, it may be because there's no foundation because nobody can verify or vet that there is anything supporting that claim that you're intending to bring into court. So this is a very, very important part of criminal law. And this guy does it. It's very mechanical. You'll see kind of interesting if you don't know anything about body cameras. So let's listen in to Mr. Jeff Rugel. And then can you tell us a little bit about what these cameras look like and how they're actually physically attached to the officer? Sure. They're about the size of a deck of cards. Um, a little black uh, rectangle. Um, there's a number of ways to, to wear them. Uh, most officers use the magnetic mount, which is basically a pretty strong magnet that goes inside the shirt and then a mounting plate that goes outside the shirt. And then the camera attaches to that mounting plate. So uh, when the magnet is engaged, it's affixed. Um, a lot of them wear it um, either in their shirt pocket or up, you know, up on the, high on the chest, which is where they're supposed to wear it. Uh, to capture, you know, a view of everything going on in front of them. Right. And uh, every officer is. All right. So what he does is he just goes on from there and he says, all right, so every officer has one and there's a way that you can connect these to the officer. Yeah, there's a serial number. So they check out the camera. It matches their name to the serial number on the camera. OK. And when they check out when they check that out, you have a way of making sure that you can locate what case they were used on. And you, can, you have a way of connecting the video file to the case file. How does that work? All right. So what we do is we do this and then we go into evidence.com, which is the, the actual website. You download it, upload it, all this stuff. And so then they say, okay, well, how about, how about this? So we, we know a lot about body cameras now, all of those, all your experience, 32 years, blah, blah, blah. But what about on this case? Were there body cameras in this case? Yeah, in fact, there were. Oh, what were those serial numbers? Oh, here's what they were. Oh, who do they belong to? That, those people. Okay. So now we have foundation. Now we know where it came from, what the background is. Then they admit it into evidence and they played the whole camera. They played the whole thing, right? This, this was a big day because they got through that whole video. The jury saw some of the people on the jury had never seen the video before or claimed they had never seen the video. Well, they did today. It was all out there. There are other angles and there's going to be more video footage for sure. But this guy, Mr. Rugel, Lieutenant Rugel, was the person who laid the foundation in order to get that admitted as an exhibit. So the jury, they're going to be able, when they're, when they're deliberating, to, be, to scroll through any of the exhibits just the video foot, or they should be able to, if the judge will allow that, but they should be able to just sort of manipulate the exhibits or at least get access to them. So this stuff will be seen by the jury panel later down the line. And we're going to see a lot more of this. So we're, we're starting, we're starting to transition already from lay person witnesses into professional witnesses. We may see more of that tomorrow. I would expect that to start pretty soon. So let's jump into some questions. Great questions typically uh, <laughs> come from uh, locals.com is the platform locals locals.com. The name of the community is watching the watchers.com. I started reading the next question before I even explained where the questions came from. Why would you do that? What a silly goose. All right. So first one comes from J bone 86 says any thoughts on the trash who was caught taking pics in the courtroom? Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, that person should probably be charged with contempt of court. I mean, they, the judge had some pretty clear guidelines on this. That person was violating the court order. That's contempt of court, and they should be charged with a crime for that. News Now Wyoming says, I was so surprised by how much of the cop body cam was muted. They muted where the cop said he has no pulse, which seems very relevant to the reasonableness of continuing to hold him. Oh, that's interesting. So that is interesting. So I did not even, when they started playing that, I didn't listen to the mutes. Um, you know, I'm sort of, I sort of hyper compress this, this stuff. So I watch it at two speed, kind of listen. Oh, okay. There's a good witness coming in. 
I'll, I'll, I'll slow it down, listen to them. But when they played the body camera, I didn't listen to it again because I've seen it multiple times. So that's interesting. Uh, and we'll see what happens on cross because when I, when I just, when I just sort of wrapped up to come in and do the show, I think they were just finishing with the body camera. So I'm not sure if they got to any cross-examination on that, but certainly they will tomorrow. And it will be very curious if they muted some very relevant information from that video. We got Pato in the house says, it seems that the media is focusing a lot on the firefighter not being allowed to access Mr. Floyd. But how would the officers at the time know she is who she said she was? If she's not a trained medical professional, she could have done more harm than good. It seems like the defense missed an opportunity to explain why they wouldn't allow her access to Mr. Floyd. Well, so it's a great point. And actually, I made this point on yesterday's show, if you missed it, but I haven't seen this else out anywhere. But yesterday, we played the clip of Mr. Nelson cross-examining her, Genevieve Hansen. And she says multiple times, he digs in on this, that if she's you know, using her fire hose or whatever to put out a burning building and somebody comes up and screams at her that she would not allow them access to her. She wouldn't allow them to deviate her from her duty. She says that multiple times. Well, what if they're screaming at you? Would that distract you? No, I would stay focused on my course. Well, what if they're threatening you? No, I would stay focused. Well, what if it's not one person? What if it's 12 people? No, I would stay focused. What if it's 20 people and there's things that they're, they're going to kill you? And she said, well, a burning building is more important than them. So I'm going to be focused on the, on the burning building. And the whole argument there is, well, of course, good for you. This is what the defense should be saying. Yes, we know that. So why were you trying to go and interfere with Derek? He was the, in that scene. He was the firefighter putting out the building would be their argument that George Floyd wasn't a, was, was somebody who broke the law. They needed to conduct an arrest. He was in the middle of doing that. Anybody who came upon him at the time was interfering with his duty. It wasn't a supervisor, wasn't anybody in uniform. She should absolutely not have access to him. That makes good sense right? Because he's in the middle of it. And she confirmed that that's a pretty good standard in her own testimony by saying, if somebody were to come up to me, I would not allow them to deviate me from my duty. Okay. Well, that's exactly what Chauvin was doing. And you came upon him and tried to deviate him from his duty. And so I think people are sort of missing that whole point. Yeah. They was, she was a random person as far as the cops are concerned. That's what the defense will say. We have Osak says, Rob, big fan of the show. Big fan of you, Osak. So what happens when the witness is someone both sides want to use to help their case? Who gets the first swing with the person? Does this cause any problems for either side? Um, you know, typically, typically, typically not. You know, these witnesses usually, you usually get witnesses who kind of will side one or the other. There are strategies, though, for using one witness against. So uh, using one side's witness against them. So an example that this comes up with a lot is when we have, let's say you have a, uh, early on in my career, let's say there, there are, there were situations where my clients would not be able to afford an expert witness where they cannot hire somebody who is an expert to come in and testify on their behalf. The expert witnesses in DUI cases are government witnesses because they work for the government. They're the ones testing the blood. So typically the defense will want to hire their own expert witness to come in and testify about the blood results. So if you don't have a defendant who can afford to hire an expert witness and you're not a public defender. So you don't get public funds for that or you, whatever, right? It's, it's a, it's a procedural problem. What do you do? Well, you have to get very good at using the expert witness in your favor. And so you got to get really up to speed about you know, what, what are they going to testify to? What studies are they going to use and be prepared with studies that will oppose or will, uh, shed light in a different way on the studies that they're sort of leaning on. And so you can prepare for it for both, for, you know, in, in both directions, but you know, really if it's a, if it's an absolutely neutral witness, then both sides are going to claw over that person. And it, you'll see a lot of that come out in cross-examination. And so they both can theoretically call one witness. It just doesn't practically uh, happen that often. Typically it'll come out one way or the other during a cross-examination. All right. We got Ma Fox in the house says, so how do you feel about the cops checking his pulse and noting that he's technically dead, but still not getting off of him? Where do we draw the line of this is too much and you must render aid to those in your custody? Well, I think that's a, that's a really bad fact. Yeah, that's a really bad fact. And it, it, you know, I'm, I'm not, if I can be candid with you, I've not seen it, it sort of characterized that way. So the cops 
and maybe there's a moment, maybe I just missed it, where the cops like check his pulse and say, oh, he's he's dead and we're not getting off of him. I don't know if that's if that's how that happened. But yeah, that's that's a problem. Right. And this is where this entire sort of manslaughter, depraved mind, uh, something that is so imminently dangerous to other people. There are there is language in the statutes that Chauvin is being charged under. That, that are saying, you know, it's it's depraved mind. It's like, yeah, if somebody's dead, right, or, or their pulse is not there, that's kind of a pretty good trigger or a good sign that maybe you want to inquire into that further. There's no question about that. And so if that, you know, if that if that's accurate, if they're picking up Floyd's, you know, wrist, nope, uh, he's dead. All right, well, just keep your knee on there in case. I don't feel a pulse or anything. He's not breathing, but just keep it there, right? That is... I think ex- extremely difficult to explain away to a jury. How do you how do you how do you say that, right? Because the the original I think justification for not moving is that he is contained and subdued and they're waiting for the EMTs to arrive. But if he is literally dying in front of them, you would expect them to modify their response to try to prevent that from happening. But I, but I, but if but if this is accurate, like if he knew that if they knew that he was dying or or dead right in front of them and they didn't act, that would be different than if they didn't know. If they didn't know, then you could at least you got a little bit of, of gray area there. But if they if they unequivocally knew, and this is probably going to be something that they fight about, right, Ma? So even if you've got you know even if it's framed one way as hey we checked his pulse he's technically dead. You know, somebody's going to come out and say, no, I, you know, I just, I couldn't tell. Maybe it was the wrong area. Sometimes you can't catch a pulse. I didn't feel it right. Whatever those, those little tentacles may be. It's a good question though. And so I, I you know, I, I, I done, I, I've, I've heard a lot about the pulse, but I haven't seen it sort of pinpointed or seen video where he says, oh, he's technically dead or noting that he's technically dead. That's, that's not good. We have Sharon Quinney says, I'm not sure about this. But can a person get in trouble for interfering with police officers? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, it's called obstruction of justice. If so, and if the cops were totally out of line, why didn't this fellow get in trouble? So you must be talking about uh, the, old, the, uh, the old fellow. Yeah, there it is. Why didn't he get in trouble? Well, I, you know, I, I don't think he was. There, there are different tiers of interference, right? So just coming by and say, what's going on here? Are the cops going to arrest everybody who does that? No, they'd be arresting every, you know, every bystander for every t- type of public crime. But it's when somebody is, you know, if a cop gives you a lawful order, hey, stand back, put your phone down, stop recording, you know, if that is lawful in your state or whatever the rules are. But if they give you an order, go sit down over there and you refuse, then at that point in time, the cops may say, all right, enough of this already. You're getting charged with a crime too. They can call it obstruction of justice, failure to obey a lawful order. We have those here in Arizona. We have a lot of cities that also have their own versions of, of those orders. So there are a lot of things that a cop can do. But in this case, probably just didn't think it was justified. We have Ma Fox says falsifying evidence is a serious crime. I highly doubt the prosecution was that careless. Yeah, that is that. So that's that's a good point about the muting. I can't imagine they did that. You know, they may have muted it for the audio, maybe for us listening. If there was any information, I don't know what they would mute, though. Yeah, so I would I would take a look at that. You know, fact check. Look, fact check any of these comments. Okay. (laughs) These are, these are live questions. So, you know, just go, go look it up for yourself. Right. Uh, That's, I think a pretty good rule in general. Not that, not that we don't trust anybody here. These are all locals. These are all people from locals. These are the, these are the most esteemable people on the internet, quite frankly, (laughs) just outstanding a plus level people. So go over there. If you want to hang out with some of those folks, we got hack consulting in the house that says if that firefighter is so concerned with the burning building to not be concerned with idiots around her, then she's only there for a paycheck and doesn't care about anything except looking good in a uniform. A good firefighter cares about everything going on in the situation. And and if idiots are intruding on cops, people die. Yeah. So yeah, I, 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 she was digging her heels in because she felt like that was the right thing to do, but I don't think it served her her well. And honestly, I'm not real sure that Eric Nelson knows, like knows that Uh, he may have been going a different direction on how to utilize that by saying, by, by wanting her to answer that, yes, I would have been thrown off, off guard on that. And then maybe adjusted the response accordingly. We have Jay bone again says, should the prosecution be worried about desensitizing the jury by playing videos of George Floyd over and over again? Seems it was an issue in the Rodney King trial. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe. So, you know, Robert Barnes, who, we've had on this channel. He's, uh, he was commenting today, uh, good observation about how emotional this, a lot of these witnesses have been. 
a lot of emotion, a lot of tears, a lot of crying, a lot of anger, a lot of animosity, a lot of people very upset about that. But none of that really answers the question about cause of death, cause of death, drugs, asphyxiation, drugs, cardiac arrest. What was it? Well, all of this is all nice, nice but it doesn't answer the question about what killed him. And so, you know, jurors might get sick of it. They may get sick of seeing it. We've seen, you know, how many times can you see a man die in front of you before you get to the real issue? It's like, hey, I've had enough appetizers. Give me the meal. Let's get down to brass tacks here. What really happened? And so if you sort of, you know, have your nose rubbed in it this, in, in, in the same horrific scene over and over again, people might instinctually react to that. NY Renal MD says, I couldn't hear anything that mentioned the pulse when they checked. Only they could only they could say what it was. Could the other cops be called by the defense? Uh, so ye, theoretically, yes, but they would all um, they would all I, I would guess refuse to testify, right? Because it's it's not their trial. They have a right against self incrimination. They have a right not to testify, and if they were forced to testify in this case, they could say something that might jeopardize their case. And so I don't think that they would be required to testify, but it's a good point. Yeah. And I, I don't think that that would happen. We got woodworking medic says with the whole pulse check thing and not letting go, we take patients that are completely paralyzed and sedated, but PD will still handcuff them to the stretcher. Blows my mind. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, I, Hey, right. You see in those movies where like a guy's in a coma with like his head wrapped up in like a million bandages and he's like strapped to the thing. You're like, he's not going anywhere, folks, but you never know. And so it's better safe than sorry, I guess, is the general rule when it comes to law enforcement. So uh, good questions on that. That's it for the Derek Chauvin trial. We'll be back here tomorrow with more coverage, of course. So make sure you subscribe. If you want to join and support the show, check us out over at Locals.com. Our community is called Watching the Watch.